Okay. Um, uh, this is the name of the talk. In case you are here for a different one, uh, don't worry. You can go to the one that you actually are going to hear. Um, uh, what, I'm oh, what I'm going to try to do today is uh, show you uh, or explain you a few cases where you can have uh, memory issues. Uh, I'll, I'll try to go through most of the cases. It's really hard to actually have a definite guide or something like you will see in a YouTube video. Uh, this one works, one link, mega, 4K, full HD, uh, fixes all the issues. Uh, it, it's really hard to get that, uh, especially for memory issues. Uh, why? Because they can happen for many reasons. And that you can fix them on, on, many, on many ways. Uh, so what we are going to do is just try to uh, talk about some of the cases I have seen. Some of them are worse than others, but uh, that, that's it, yeah. Um, my name, I think you all know now my name and my birthday. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's my email, that's my Twitter, if you wanna reach out some, sometime. Uh, I don't tweet too much, but if you are into that, uh, that's my Twitter. Um, uh, what, what, what's, uh, the stock is, I mean, uh, just as I say, previously, this is more about talking, and if you really want to, or if you have a memory leak, or if you have a, uh, something wrong with your, with your application, and you want to probably discuss a, bit, a little bit uh, more in deep, uh, we can just talk later the talk, or uh, I'll be giving a workshop at 2 p.m., uh, just around the corner, uh, about memory leaks, and we can just run some uh, examples, and just I'll let you know how to fix them and how to identify them. So if you want to have something uh, more practical, uh, you have it. See you at 2 p.m. Um, <clears throat> so this is the question I usually uh, ask. Why? Because people are really excited to just raise their hand because, hey, me too, I have it. And there's more people that raise it is, yeah, yeah, you too, you too. So, uh, so th this is the question, how many of you have a memory leak or a memory issue? You can remember the number of the times or you can remember the last time. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, this is this is pretty interesting because uh, the, there's something uh, great about JavaScript and Node.js in general is that you really don't need to uh, learn from the beginning about how to deal with this type of issues. And I think that's what makes Node and JavaScript uh, really uh, a language that everybody can is, get it start and actually start to build stuff. Because you really don't need to uh, learn this. The issue is that when you have to learn this, it's on Friday night. When production is down and someone is calling you, hey, why, my, why the, the server is, uh, what application is not working? Why, why is down? Or have you seen this application? Uh, well, or why this server, uh, or this service is not running? Um, so it does, it, don't worry. It happens in real life, it happens in TNT, it happens in all the companies. Do not worry, you're not alone. Uh, it happens to only, including the best one. And, and I can uh, make sure, be sure that that's true. Uh, we have, at NodeSource, we have been uh, working with different companies. Some of them have uh, products that you are using right now. And with really critical uh, process that they need to handle in Node.js applications. And they are really bad and complicated applications. Uh, so do not feel bad. Feel bad. Uh, it happens to engineers at big companies, so why it cannot happen to you? Uh, so let's start with the most important uh, part of uh, detecting a memory leak or actually trying to fix it is uh, one of the things is uh, check the HIP profiler and the timeline. Uh, 
what the timeline is or what the heap profile, heap profile it is. The timeline is just uh, a tool. I, I think how many of you have used the Chrome Dev Tools? Yeah. Okay. You can see the the timeline. The timeline is, is really not something that is going to tell you exactly what the issue is, uh, but it's pretty much for you to understand when and, or, or at what time it decided to slow down. Because one of the things with, uh, with Node.js applications is that you not only can do servers you know, or, or REST APIs or something like that. So uh, the memory can happen, uh, the memory leak can happen uh, not only when you are receiving connection, but the memory, can, uh, memory leak can happen uh, when you are doing some processing or something like that. So it doesn't mean that the, 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 the leaks or memory issues only happen on applications that you get uh, load or something like that, or customers just joining the, your application or something like that. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest issues too, uh, to try to understand that because you know something and you know that uh, this could probably be an issue. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that it's going to apply every time. So you have to be really uh, sure that you know your application. You know what are the bottlenecks, and that's something that we are going to uh, discuss later. Um, so the timeline is just for you to understand at what time your application started to not work as expected, um, and the heap profiler is just to get all the information in all the nodes and. Are the roots inside uh, your application at that time, um, or at the time you took the the uh, the heap the, the heap the heap profile? Um, so the, you, you really, uh, when you are trying to fix this kind of, this type of issues, you really need to have a workflow on how to detect or how to fix it. And this one is it, this one is actually a really good one. Uh, I call it. TST, uh, but it's the three snapshot technique. Uh, but in, in the, uh, I mean, it depends on the case because sometimes it's worse. So I change it for a T three T T that it means three. Uh, no, it's four. Uh, so F T F S T is four snapshot technique or five snapshot technique. Why? Because it really depends on the application. Uh, but if you're just going to start digging uh, and just to start to understand what application is doing, you really need to embrace that work, uh, that way to figure out things. And I didn't invent this. Uh, it, 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 was, it was actually someone at, at the Gmail team. Uh, it's called Lorena Lee. So thanks for thanks to her for that. Uh, uh, what, what this means is that you take. Uh, heap profile at the beginning of your application as a cold star. Why? Because you need to make sure how your application is in memory when it starts. Then you start to uh, increase the load. So you just start sending more and more uh, uh, requests or whatever your application does. And af after a certain point, it could be one minute, two minutes, three minutes, uh, you take another heap of a heap a snapshot. Uh, and after more time, it could be another two or three minutes, you take a different one. Uh, so why will you do that? Or why will you uh, take uh, three snapshots at different times? Well, it's because you really want to make sure which objects are the ones that are increasing over the time. And the only uh, way to know that is knowing how your application started. And after a period of time, which objects are newer or didn't disappear from the first snapshot compared with the second snapshot. And that ha if, if you want to make com uh, be completely sure, you, you compare the second snapshot with the third snapshot. So you are making sure that you are going to look only for the uh, objects in your hip uh, snapshot that are still alive, that are not being garbage collected. Uh, so that's a really good technique. You should totally use it. Uh, so there's something um, in the Chrome DevTools, and I think how many of you have take a uh, heap snapshot before? Yeah, and there's a bunch of columns that you see a percentage of for each column, and usually 
uh, you don't know what uh, what any of any of them mean, uh, and it's fine. I mean, it, it, it takes some time to to understand all of that and what is important. But uh, uh, something I I really I highly recommend is to check uh, for the distance. Uh, there's a column called distance in the uh, in the Chrome developer tool when you check a heap snapshot. And something I have seen for, for, a, for a while is that the closest and the, 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 the constructor that has the, the closest uh, or the, the minimum, the closest it will be like two or three uh, number in the distance column is usually the one that is responsible for the memory leak. So that's something is not completely uh, true for all the applications, but I have seen many cases, and that's what I can usually recommend. If you see uh, uh, a, a big constructor, and that constructor is really close to that root, uh, that means that the, you, you should actually go for that and start to look on that direction, because it's pretty sure that that uh, constructor is going to have uh, the memory leak. Uh, yeah, so check for constructor, uh, constructors. Uh, usually check uh, some of the call stack. Uh, that's something I'm going to recommend at the end. But uh, how many of I mean, how many of you name your functions, or you just make function uh, the arguments and all that stuff? Well, when you don't name your functions, and I think there was kind of fixed uh, by the time, and, and I think in Node. A, uh, something was implemented on BA that it didn't. Uh, it didn't matter that you did. Uh, you didn't name your applications because something in BA was more intelligent than us. So it was uh, kind of generating names for unnamed uh, functions. However, uh, when you start to look at the heap snapshot, uh, you start to see uh, in the call stack that there's a lot of functions and they don't have names. So there's actually no way for you to track where this call uh, is being done or, or how you can actually fix the, uh, fix the issue. So uh, you, I, I highly recommend just put a name. Uh, don't put an X or a Y or something like that on your functions. It's not really helpful. Uh, seriously, when, when you are trying to debug uh, stuff, and especially for heap and memory, you really want to make sure that you have all the complete information. Uh, and this is only talking if your application is not minified or transpiled. If your application is minified or transpiled and you don't have source maps, then you are going to have a really good time trying to figure out what this strange symbol transpiled to my uh, code. So uh, have fun with that on Friday. Uh, 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 this is something I. Yeah, this is something that people actually don't know is that you can generate redact, uh, redacted snapshots. What this means is when you take a heap snapshot, it takes, uh, you are going to see all the strings, uh, and most of those strings have sensitive data. So if you are going to send this heap snapshot to someone, just please make it uh, redacted. So any of the strings, I mean, strings are not, the content of the strings are not important for the person. Uh, or the company or whatever, or the service that is going to fix the, uh, the issue or actually do consulting for you. Uh, but do it because it's probably going to have all your secrets of your application, including credit cards, information, and all the stuff. So really take care of that. If you don't uh, strip the strings and you keep a snapshot, you are giving someone else information about your application and probably your users. So, so just be careful because you are sending information to someone else that is really uh, highly relevant. Uh, and there's this one, card dumps. And this one are really interesting because it's, uh, it's probably less used. Uh, and usually when you use, uh, the people who use card dumps, uh, they usually uh, are familiar with C++ and all the debugger uh, tooling that that's out there for C++ or C. Or C. Uh, uh, but, but you can actually do core dumps on 
note too, and and, I, and and it's weird because when I talk about this, people do not uh, do not know that you can actually do that and actually have um, more interesting information because uh, with cardums we can uh, in real time uh, actually uh, it's it's like uh, a travel time when you can actually know the state of an application or something at certain point or a certain uh, period of time, and. That doesn't happen with the heap snapshots. You are the one that is trying to collect all the information in the memory at certain uh, time. So cordoms are really interesting. Um, they take a while to understand, especially if you are not familiar with uh, any debugger on C++ or C. Or C. Uh, to create a, card, a cordom, usually uh, what you have to do is uh, most of the time, just send a, a signal to abort, or you can put on your code the process that abort. Uh, but what that means is that you have to modify uh, uh, your code to actually uh, trigger the card dump. And the, the, card, dump, uh, the card dump is actually, uh, is expected to be triggered when there's an unhandled uh, exception. Uh, however, you can I mean you can do that or you can just use this option when you're running your application so you don't have to modify anything and it's going to uh, abort every time you have an unhandled exception. Uh, it, it's, it's just way better to not modify your code and especially if you are on production, you cannot modify uh, your code to uh, actually get all the unhandled expressions or every time you throw something to uh, do something weird, and, and and something is when you get the core file with the previous one, uh, uh, with the process that abort, you can uh, you get more stack traces that are not really relevant to the uh, to the to the problem. Why? Because you are modifying the code to actually make it break at some point to actually abort. So don't actually do it if you really have to make sure that you are aborting at, a, at some point, and you are not able to trigger. Uh, in the, I mean, because it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty normal. I mean, how many of you have had an issue that is on production, but it never happens, it never happens on development? Yeah, it's like every day, right? It's, it's, that happens all the time, and usually uh, there's a few things that you can do for that, uh, especially with the stress testing, uh, you can actually prevent some of those cases, but there's another talk. Um, uh, so yeah, you can use that. It's better. You don't get too much uh, things on your core file. You get only everything that you actually need. Uh, then you can use Alola DB. It's the vulgar. It's not database. Uh, <laughs> that happens a lot. That confusion. Uh, uh, you can use that to actually uh, inspect and get uh, uh, all the information that uh, you actually need from the core file. Uh, there, there's, uh, we, we can go more in deep in that, but that's, that's trying to explain how a debugger works for C++. And I think that's, that's too much. Uh, there, there's something called L, L node that is kind of plugin for LLTV. Uh, yeah, a little TV. Uh, what was uh, what's the thing with this is that you can actually get a stack trace, uh, JavaScript a stack trace. So it's very really useful. What I think is, uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, highly developed uh, at this moment. Uh, something something that is not uh, good about core files is that you have to make sure that the uh, debugger that you are using and the core file are on sync conversions. Why? Because if you are using uh, a, debug, a core file that has, for example, uh, something in V8 uh, or a different version of V8 than your debugger has, uh, then you're going to have a problem because if that change, if there's something that changed between versions, then the debugger is not going to be able to catch that. So you are missing information. You are making core files uh, out of nothing and and it's not, not, not going to be worth it because you're not getting the whole story or the whole picture for your application. Um, and that's one of the things I would say. Uh, just make sure that you are running uh, the same versions between the debugger and the moment you're 
uh, build in the core file. If not, then you are going to have a hard time trying to figure out why your uh, core file doesn't have certain things because it's probably named different in, sometimes in V8, uh, uh, something in the structure just changed the name. And because of that, there's no way to know that. There's no way that the debugger and the core file are going to link that because they don't know what, what happened. Uh, promises, uh, so, something uh, interesting uh, with promises uh, is uh, promises are really hard to handle. And something with uh, memory is that when you when, when, when the when the promise is, is not the same when the promise finish uh, to when the promise abort. So when you take a, for example, a, a heap snapshot or something or a car dump, uh, you can act, sometimes you get the promise finish, but it doesn't mean uh, the state of the promise can change uh, during that time until it aborts. So that's one of the unknown things about promises. I mean, this is one of many, and I think you, on the previous talk, just saw that. Uh, so make sure that you understand promises really well. If not, you are going to have a uh, really hard time. I think we all have with promises already a hard time. Uh, but I actually recommend a sync await. Uh, so please, if you uh, still not using a sync await, just do it. It's really important that you uh, try to embrace this. It's way cleaner. It's much easier to debug and it's going to be less painful. Uh, I actually really highly recommend it. Uh, so I have some tips for different situations. I know that people usually look for something to not do uh, so they can avoid this type of things. Uh, one of these is on server-side rendering. I'm not saying you should not do server-side rendering. It's just that you should do it properly. Uh, why I'm saying this? because we have seen companies that doing server-side rendering that they have a really big uh, views on how they uh, do the transpilation or, or, or all the process of the server-side rendering. And uh, when, when you do that, you have, to, uh, you have to know that there's a cost, there's a trade-off. And what that means is that a, a simple a Node.js application can start on 20 megabytes or 30 megabytes if it's too complex of, of memory on a cold start. However, for a server-side rendering, it can start on 200 megabytes of memory, 300 megabytes of memory, and that's just a starting. It's doing nothing. Why? Because most of the server-side rendering, all the components or everything that is being processed is a storing memory. So when you do keep snapshots of server-side rendering applications, you are going to see many strings or many template in the strings on, your, on memory. And that's how pretty much a server-side rendering works. So it's going to be way harder to actually strip all those uh, uh, objects or strings or whatever the server-side engine is creating. Uh, so if you're using server-side rendering, make sure that you know what is the tra trade-off and you know the cost. And that's something people do not understand. They, Usually, I understand that there's reasons uh, for some architects to use something, but usually memory is not that because we are so used to when something doesn't work, it's just just put more, more memory, more cores, and let's make, because it's pretty easy in, in AWS just to increase that, so it doesn't matter if, it, if it's not working, just put more, more memory and more cores and we will be fine. Uh, the case two uh, is monitoring tools. Uh, make sure that you are choosing the right monitoring tools. Why? Uh, how many of you have been using Dynatrix at some point? Probably a few. Well, if you do a CP profile or do a HIP snapshot, you are going to, or if you see the stock, uh, the call stock, uh, what you are going to see is that Dynatrix is grabbing almost every function every call, why? Because uh, Dynatrix needs to know what is happening with your application, but the way they do it, they grab all of that, every call. So uh, you just make sure that I have seen people just blaming Dynatrix uh, because 
uh, because this function is taking too much time or is way too common in the heap snapshot, but it doesn't, it, uh, most of the time uh, there's agents or monitoring tools that they just grab the calls because they need to get information, but it doesn't mean that they are the responsible. And that's something that you learn with CPU profiles and heap CPU snapshots. Uh, so just make sure, there, there's a few tools that cause an overhead on memory, but you really have to understand how the monitoring tool that you are implementing actually works. If not, then you're going to have a hard time and you start calling Dynatrace, hey, hey, you just broke my application and that's, that's not good. Uh, close your connections. Um, and I think I have a really interesting case here. Um, if you can see, uh, why is this? Let me close that. Okay. Uh, I tried to create a, uh, what I'm doing, let me see. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, um, I'm not sure if you can see it. Uh, well, the, this is a, just a, a Mongo application. Uh, it's a REST API. Uh, it's just pretty simple, nothing special. It, is, it, ha, it's, it has a Mongo uh, database that is being loaded with random data. Uh, and this is probably the closest uh, exercise that I can find to explain people why you should close your connections. Uh, because if we, this was, I'm going to mirror so I can, um, if you, See, here I'm just going to uh, start, then I'll start the Mongo, and yeah, just ignore the fact of the cat that just appeared on my screen, uh, and the thousand tabs on my, okay, this is, uh, this is Sensolid, if you never uh, have used that or seen that. Uh, it's a monitoring tool. You can do other stuff. Well, one of these, uh, this one has something interesting is that you can see this graph is CPU and for the X axis and memory on the Y axis. So well, uh, our application is here in uh, 12 megabytes, between 12 and uh, 14 megabytes. So I'm going to just add a bit more of uh, some load. Uh, you see how Mongo starts to get crazy. Uh, and you see, that's, uh, and it just got increased in memory and that's fine. I mean, that's how it's supposed to work. If it, if it, if it recovers, that will be the natural uh, way but it doesn't recover. It never garbage collect the rest of the objects that it just create and doesn't need anymore. So if you see, and if I keep increasing the load, I mean, another 100 users. Uh, where's, you see, it's going to increase, 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 increase in memory, but it's never going to recover. And this is a memory leak. This is actually a memory leak. Why? Because the application is not recovering. That's, that's how you identify that you are having memory issues. Uh, so how do we fix this? It's, it's actually very simple. You just do client close after you said, send the answer. And you, the, the issue was that you were not closing the connection after you answer, uh, now you fix it, the memory leak. Uh, so I, this is one of the things that uh, I, I really 
uh, make people understand is that uh, let's just follow best practices. Don't think that if you're doing some uh, missing something and it, the, the application uh, doesn't break, it doesn't mean that it's not doing wrong things on the inside uh, because it's, it actually is, and it's going to break later and really hard, and it's going to be way harder to uh, to to recover and try to debug and understand what the application is doing. So the, the only issue here was, it wasn't even uh, Mongo, but some people blame Mongo for everything. I mean, I, I blame Mongo for many things, <laughs> but this, at this time, it wasn't even Mongo. Mongo was fine. Uh, we are doing everything fine, except that we don't close connections because we think this, it's fine to have connections open. Uh, so, uh, where is yeah? So close your connections, please do it. You don't want a lot of uh, things uh, being kept, uh, especially if you use Apollo. How many of you use Apollo? Uh, well, you probably use it or GraphQL. When you keep your connections open, the objects created for Apollo or GraphQL, they are stored in memory. So you are keeping all of that and not getting garbage collected. Uh, look for NGST service to page, uh, uh, to serve pages. Uh, uh, what this means is you actually, the way you serve stuff actually uh, matters for your application too. So, Make sure that you have a way not, uh, you implement a way to be not attached to a certain platform, but you can actually try it on different ones. Why? Because some of, some, a few times uh, is the way you serve things. Uh, and you can, if you can actually uh, try in different ways, it's really helpful for you to at least discard the way you are serving th uh, things. And something interesting, and we have seen a lot, is review your package that are, uh, that are uh, CS, CSS to or in JavaScript or to JavaScript or something like that. Uh, just please review that. Make sure that you, you know what the package is actually doing. That's a lot of translation. That's a lot of uh, compilation. Uh, that's a lot of things that are, are happening there in those packages. Uh, if you are really not sure or if you think that's a cool package, just make sure that it doesn't impact your, perf uh, your memory and special performance. Uh, a lot of these package store many things on memory because they have to do templating of the things that you do and what that translates to, for example, JavaScript. Uh, so please check that. If you have a dependency, just check it. Uh, and keep naming, naming your functions. Uh, that's something I explained before, please do it. Uh, it's really helpful, I'm telling you, you are going to be really happy to know that you know the specific function where the issue is. Uh, and, and, and again, if you're doing a lot of uh, minified code or if you're working with TypeScript, you really want to start using source maps so you don't get uh, unreadable uh, code in your uh, snapshots that you cannot understand or fix. Uh, yeah, and this one is the most interesting one because I, I have seen combinations of uh, Node.js and Java backend servers and many other combinations. And one of the things is I have seen Java uh, servers or database or, or other service that send information to Node.js servers, uh, services. Um, and one of the things is uh, we had a team that was blaming the no, the, the Java team was blaming the Node.js team because it was taking too much time. It was taking four seconds to process many things. Uh, but we just jump uh, a node source uh, to the call and we figure out that the Java service was actually taking the four seconds to process and get back to the service. So make sure that you actually understand where the bottleneck is, and sometimes it's a network bottleneck. It's not your application uh, bottleneck. Or you can just blame the Java team. That actually works sometimes. Uh, uh, crazy, right? I mean, 
and I, and I could just keep going and keep going and keep going on all of the reasons and possibilities that you can uh, have actually an issue with memory. Uh, but uh, this is pretty much like a whole view or a general view of how to look for and what probably you, can, uh, you don't want to do uh, or at least try to avoid as much as you can and try to fix it later. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much.